Hey everyone, you're listening to the 107 podcast where we get together every fortnight and sometimes more often to talk about technology, business and the humans in it. I'm your host Ivan Stegic. My guest today is Clementine Jacoby, who is the executive director of Recidivis, a nonprofit co-founded by Clementine in 2019 that is building a technical foundation for a more accountable and self-improving criminal justice system. Before that, she spent four years at Google as a product manager, where she worked on Google Maps and Android. Welcome, Clementine. It's great to have you on. Thanks, Yvonne. Excited to be here. Let's start very simply. Where did you grow up and why did you choose to go to Stanford? I was born in Boston and sort of spent my childhood years in Iowa and Germany and then went to high school in Utah and also in London. But uh, Utah is, is where I feel like I'm from and that's where I am now. I chose to go to Stanford because they had this program called Symbolic Systems, where you could study computer science and philosophy and cognitive science and linguistics, which are, were sort oh my of God. my four favorite topics. So it, it seems sort of magical that they that they would all be in one major. So that's that's where I went, and that's what I did. What exactly uh, did you study when you were there? I studied symbolic systems, and I also did a lot of work in the D school at Stanford, which is their design school, which has really been one of the pioneers in human-centered design. And when I was a kid, I wanted to be an inventor, like with a lab coat and goggles. And so, I don't know, being a product designer sort of felt like the closest thing to that. So that's what I spent my undergrad doing. And it sounds like you were an aerialist in the circus troupe or two as well. How did you decide to do that? What was the origin story for that? <laughs> yeah, it's true. I I took a year off from Stanford halfway through because I, at that point it felt like there were, were two clear, plausible career paths. One was being a circus performer and the other was being a software <laughs> engineer. And so I, I thought that it would be good to like figure out which of these things I was going to do. And so I took a year off and like a true uh, scientist had an experimental design for the year where I, I did two circus troops and two software engineering internships. And at the end of the year, I didn't like either of them. <laughs> so <laughs> I became a product manager, which I loved. And is there anything from your experience being in the circus troupe that you brought with you into your product management at Google? Oh, sure. I mean, product management is <laughs> its very performative. A lot of it is getting people interested in the thing you're doing. So I think that's, that's pretty much the same across the two fields. And what were you responsible for at Google as a product manager? I, I alluded to the fact that you were interested in or worked on the Google Maps API and Android. But I think there's some gaming involvement there as well. Google has this program called the APM program, and it's a rotational program. So you work on two different projects over two years. My first project was focused on the Internet of Things and in my second project, I worked on using Google Maps data to build a platform to make it easy to build real world games. Neither of these things were things that I was personally passionate about, but I think that what Google does so well is give young people real responsibility. They give you ownership over, in some cases, brand new projects. And so you feel like your successes are your own and your failures are your own. And it's, it was really a thrilling, I loved Google, um, but I, I ultimately sort of got bored of the actual problems that we were working on in tech. I think we spend a lot of time working on the problems we experience, like recruiting and ordering food and uh, getting your inbox to zero. So I don't know, it seemed like there were probably better things to be working on at a certain point. And so you took one of the 20% projects that you were working on and, you know, turned it into a company or a nonprofit, right? Right. Why not? Yeah, why not, right? How did the 20% project that now is Recidivis first start? What was the impetus there? I grew up with family members in prison, so I think I was always interested in our criminal justice system just from the human angle, but... I think when I got to college and after college, I, I started realizing the extent to which it was a, a very special problem, you know, that the United States 
incarcerates more people than than any country at any point in the history of the world. And also that, you know, the way we got there is that we sort of use criminal justice to to solve all of these other social ills, like 40 percent of people with a serious mental illness in this country come into contact with our criminal wow, justice system at 40%. some point. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're using prisons for all the things they were never designed for, which is a, a fascinating problem. Another wild stat is that every 25 seconds, someone in America is arrested for drug possession. And so, you know, we're using prisons for mental health, for addiction treatment. And uh, as a result, it's a massive problem statement. So I think that's extremely interesting. The other part of criminal justice that felt important to me and part of the reason I left Google is just because there's this really big why now. There's bipartisan alignment around unwinding mass incarceration and various serious people on both sides of the political aisle are are looking at the system and saying enough. You know, they arrive at the conclusion from different places, perhaps, but it's one of the only things that Republicans and Democrats actually agree on right now. And I think for that reason, among so many others, it's it's a really interesting time to be trying to make progress on this problem that is important and sits at the intersection of many other also important social issues. So it sounds like you were in the right place at the right time by pursuing the 20% project. And I'm surprised I didn't know there was bipartisan alignment on something at all in Congress, quite honestly. Surprising. Does that mean that legislation has passed and there's funds that are being put towards figuring out the system and fixing it? So I think mass incarceration in its current form started kind of in 1970 and prison populations and parole and probation populations steadily and swiftly grew until about 2007 to 2010. Um, and in the last sort of decade, we've started to make some progress. You're starting to, you know, see where the peak was and, and that we're coming down a little bit. And so the game now is is about accelerating that progress. We would have to reduce incarceration by something like 75 percent in order for America to even come into the global average range. Wow. So the extent to which we're an outlier here is sort of hard to overstate. Like there's an enormous amount of work to do. But just getting past that peak is what the bipartisan alignment made possible, like turning that corner, mm. which I do think we've turned. We just we just haven't, you know, made anywhere near enough progress yet. Yeah, we have 75% to go to even make it to average. To even make so it to like, average. I'd say there's, that's, that's a lot of work that we need to do. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the word recidivism, which is what your nonprofit's name is based on. I read that there isn't exactly a common understanding of what that word means. Can, can you describe what the problem is? with that word. Yeah, uh, that's correct. It's an extremely fraught term, I will say. The basic notion is that recidivism is a measurement of how many people who, who leave prison are winding back up there. But there, mm. are, there are lots of issues with it. So, so as a metric, right, your one job is to just mean the same thing in every context. Mm -hmm. Like, what if every uh, country measured GDP differently. That would that would not be super useful. So that's basically what recidivism does. We measure it differently in every context, and so as a metric, it fails pretty spectacularly. But the the other thing that's bad about recidivism is that it measures failure. So it's sort of like measuring schools based on dropout rates, but mm. nothing else, right? No test scores, no future earnings, and then and then a third thing that's bad about recidivism, and then. I'll stop, uh, <laughs> <laughs> is that it's measured very infrequently. So typically recidivism is this three-year average, and it's often reported annually. And when it's reported, it's often a few years behind. So it's this like wildly Lagging. useless thing to optimize for. It's like if you said, mm. I'm going to lose weight, but then you only weighed yourself once a year. And when you did, you were told what your weight was a year and a half ago. It's just like not super helpful for trying to make progress in real time. 
So it sounds like the fix for that is easy, right? You make uh, you make the word mean the same thing globally, and then you report that data more often. But it sounds like that's not exactly very easy to do. Well, I mean, that's basically what we're trying to do. And we're also trying to do it for a lot of other metrics, more nuanced metrics like what is the experience of people in prison and on supervision? What's leading to success? What's leading to failure? Where do we not have treatment in the community? And, and how is that causing failure? What do geographical and racial and demographic disparities look like? So the name is a little bit of a misnomer because we're certainly not only or even principally interested in recidivism. But I think the problems around this really important metric were one of the things that sort of drew us to the space initially and made us think like, ah, oh, there's something solvable there. Like there's something technology can actually help with. I think in general, technology is not the solution to very many of the world's most important problems. But in this case, there's something really useful to do with data, and there's a way in which a, a very basic technology problem is actually getting in the way of kind of otherwise momentous change. So the so the name of the nonprofit is Recidiviz, and the viz part is like the visualization of data. My understanding is that your product is a data visualization dashboard that correctional facilities and prisons use. Is that a fair description or or did I get that wrong? No, that's very close. I mean, we build a number of products and a dashboard is one of them. I think taking a step back, what we're trying to do is make sure that criminal justice decision makers have the data that they need to drive a change to drive better outcomes. And so we build tools, including dashboards, that help leadership and staff see their own metrics, their metrics compared to other systems, and then how they can improve. So we're like Fitbit, you know, but for criminal justice agencies. <laughs> <laughs> Fitbit for criminal justice agencies. Got it. Where does all this data come from? Interestingly, we're already collecting most of what we need. What we're not doing is making it useful in any way. And it turns out that it's a lot of work to just turn, you know, millions and millions of data points into something that people can actually take action on. So, so that's a big part of our job. But we're already collecting the data because we need it for tracking purposes. We need it for operational purposes. We just haven't used it yet uh, in terms of decision making tools or optimization tools in this space. Can you give us an example of some data that you're already tracking that you're using? Yeah, so a good example is that even though we report on recidivism very infrequently, when we go in and establish the recidivist platform on top of these existing state data systems, we're then able to report to them their recidivism rate every day. Um, and we can give them a three-year trailing window, a one-year trailing window, a one-month trailing window. And so sort of overnight, you can go from a place where this is a metric that you only get once a year to this is a metric that you get every day. But the other thing that you can do is now you can slice it by county. So you can see if you're getting different recidivism rates by county. You can slice it by judicial district so you can understand how judge decision making or prosecutorial decision making is impacting outcomes. And you can also slice it by sort of what's happening in the community. So is the availability of AA programs or drug treatment or mental health treatment or educational resources for young people leading to a school to prison pipeline, for example, which you can see quite clearly in the data is the case. When you first started Recidivis, it was a 20% project, and then you co-founded the nonprofit going through the program at Y Combinator. And for those who are listening who don't know what Y Combinator is, Y Combinator is a startup... Um, incubator? Uh, incubator. <laughs> incubator, yes. I couldn't think of the word. Yes, it's a startup incubator, and you usually think, think of companies like Dropbox that came out of it, and you know, multi-billion dollar companies that are certainly for profit, not non-profit. So I didn't, first of all, I didn't realize why Combinator founded companies that were non-profits. H how did you decide to go that route? And, and why did Y Combinator decide to, to go with um, you and your co-founder? So YC invests in a small handful of non-profits in every batch that they think mm. that they can help scale. And they treat you just like the rest of the batch uh, there's one partner, Tim Brady, who's a nonprofit veteran and one of the most angelic humans you'll ever meet. So he advised us on some of the nonprofit specific nuances of our work, but 
for the most part, it's the same ball game, right? You got to build something that people will use every day. And so the hard parts are all the same between for-profit and non-profit, I think. And you say so you've been founded for a year, maybe a year and a half? Yeah. So, I mean, depending on when you start the clock on recidivism, we're either two years old or, or more like four years old. As an idea and something that existed as a volunteer project, within Google, we're about four years old. As an independent nonprofit that's building enterprise software for state governments, we're about two years old. And what does your market demand look like right now? It sounds like you're working with states and with correctional facilities and prisons in states. We are. So we're working in four states right now and expanding to eight at the moment. And I think what's been interesting about the demand is that it's much higher than anyone told us it would be. <laughs> mm. And I think that, again, is because the needle has moved somewhat recently on the criminal justice reform problem, right? Until very recently, there wasn't nearly as much pressure on the state system to produce better outcomes. They weren't under as much public scrutiny. And advocates have done a great job of bringing to the government's attention the places where they would like to see better outcomes. And so now the question is, how do we use the data that we already have to optimize for success? You know, the public is no longer okay with us continuing to lock more people up. And so now we need to think differently about the problem. And, and that's why demand for these tools and for data in general to kind of chart a course to a new and different kind of system is in high demand. I don't think it would have been true 15 years ago. Do you think you'll measure success of recidivism as getting down to the average or below the global average and being in all 50 states and having successfully reformed the criminal justice system as a whole? Or do you have some other grander vision than that? No, that sounds good. Let's do that. <laughs> I think we'll do that. <laughs> okay, let's do that. That's a pretty large undertaking. I mean, the two other things I would add to it just to make it larger are that we need to do it safely and we need to do it equitably. There are lots of ways you could plausibly reduce incarceration that would actually lead to higher concentrations of black and brown people in the system. And that is not a good solution. So one of the things the data allows us to do is actually decarcerate in ways that I think do account for public safety and do account for racial disparities. And that sort of hasn't been possible before. Have you noticed from the data any of the major factors that you've learned uh, that causes recidivism the most? Have you been able to interpret anything just yet? The thing that the data clearly illustrates, I think, is that to make a huge dent in this problem, like to make the kind of progress we're talking about, we need to invest money that we will save by incarcerating fewer people in drug treatment and mental wellness and in underserved communities, which by the way, you can see in the data, right? Like today, if you are a black man without a GED, you're more likely to be behind bars than employed. And we can see in the data which communities were underfunding, which communities are disenfranchised and where we need to invest. And so I think that's, that's one thing that the data makes very clear is that we're using prisons to solve problems that would be better solved, more cheaply solved, more equitably solved, all of these things in the community. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's a solution that people can really rally behind. There's something very important about that that I think you're clearly seeing in the public narrative right now. We, we want to see investment away from our justice system into the communities and into solving these problems earlier in the pipeline. So that's, I think, the biggest takeaway that the data shows. What do private jails and private systems have to do with the problem statement? Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways it's the same problem statement. The private prison system is not as big as you might think. Most of the people we incarcerate are incarcerated not by the federal government and not by private prisons, but by states. And that's why we are focusing on states. And I think that it's an issue, but it's not the issue that we're tackling. The reason you have private prisons is because states contract to private prisons because they think that they can either produce better outcomes or incarcerate people for less money. And so to me, it feels like an extension of, of the same set of issues, which is that we don't mm. have tools to optimize for 
uh, better outcomes. And we need those sort of across the private and the public system. But the public system, to me, is more important because it impacts more people. And so the only way we can fix this is by making public policy and laws that address people going into incarceration and also preventing people that have left incarceration to prevent them from going back into uh, incarceration. And what you're saying is the data is there and we need to make it more visible and use it to make these decisions a whole lot faster and a whole lot better. Yes. And I will add one thing, which is that we also need to recognize that in addition to making our prison system better, we also need to confront how hard it is in this country to recover from incarceration. Mm. Most people who go to prison will never be eligible for most jobs or housing or even things like food stamps that were literally designed for underserved and marginalized communities. They'll be five times as likely to be unemployed. They'll earn less money when they're working and their kids will be six times more likely to enter the system. So we've created sort of a revolving door that oh many millions God. of people enter very young and then can never leave. And so if we want to really unwind this issue, we also need to get serious about reducing barriers to reentry, reducing contact in the first place, and also improving the system itself for the people who do get caught in it. It's not just the system, it's everything around it as well. Yeah. We should burn it all down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that. I'd... You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. No, we shouldn't do that. We should fix it all. And I think that's what you're trying to do. We're trying to do that. Yeah. Your website talks about a self-improving criminal justice system. What does that mean? For us, I think the main goal is that you should be able, as a person running a correction system to set a goal, track your progress, and hit that goal. So right now, running a corrections department is very much like being a CEO of a company, but with like no way to measure profit and loss or like whether or not any of your launches worked. And so it's that basic sense that, you know, today we have 50 people with an enormous amount of responsibility running an $80 billion system with hundreds of thousands of employees incarcerating millions of people who don't have these tools. And so like, let's get them the tools. Let's get them the tools that they need to set a goal, see if they're tracking towards it. Let's get them the tools they need to evaluate upfront what impact a policy will have, and then to follow up and see if that policy actually had that impact. And if it didn't, close the gap, right? So that's what we mean by a self-correcting system just giving them the ability to actively and proactively manage for the outcomes that we want to see as a citizenship and then report to us the progress on those things. Is the tool set and the product that you're building going to be available as open source technology? How does the thing you're building benefit the public, not just from a, like, only these certain correctional facilities get the tool? The set of tools that you're building, what's the approach to open sourcing it? I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more. Tell yeah, me more. Yeah, I mean, I think just one of the foundational tenets of what we're trying to do is say recidivist is not going to solve anywhere close to all of this problem. And technology is not going to solve any clo anywhere close to all of this problem. And so our approach from the beginning has been open source everything partner with people who have been doing this work for much longer than we have, stay in our lane, make sure we're not duplicating effort that other people in the mm. ecosystem are already doing or could do better. And by the way, that all takes a lot of work, right? Mm -hmm. Like just making sure that you're being a good partner and, and not redoing work that someone else could do better than you're doing feels like 80% of my job. But I think mm. it's, it's really important and we're absolutely committed to everything that we do in terms of data infrastructure being open sourced so that if we're not moving fast enough and a state wants to move even faster, they can sort of take what we've done and extend it or they could bring someone else in to extend our work um, or build something very specific to a particular state. We want all of that to happen. Is it global in nature? Are you learning from what people are doing in other countries? And are, is the software being used elsewhere? Because it's not just a U.S. problem. I mean, we have a major problem here, but it, it's a global issue as well. 
I mean, our focus is certainly on the U.S., but during COVID, we built a modeling tool that sort of showed how the virus might impact a particular facility, a prison or a jail. And it sort of helped you scenario plan. Like, if I did this, what would the impact be on viral spread, on hospitalizations? That got picked up by several other countries. Australia took it and, in true Australia fashion, made it like 100 times better than our version was. <laughs> uh, Canada used it. So that, that was very cool to see. And I think, in part, that was because COVID was new and we acted quickly. Whereas in our sort of steady state work, the problems that the U.S. has are actually quite different than, than the problems that we see in the rest of the world, where some of these data barriers have already been overcome. But but in many ways, that's also a nice thing because it provides a blueprint for where we need to get. What have you seen from the COVID effect on uh, prisons and on the work you've been doing with the states? I mean, there's so much to say about COVID. The, the vast majority of it is really horrible. It's been mm. a bad time to be in prison. It's been a bad time to be a prison administrator. The flip side is that it's unleashed a huge amount of creativity from state and local governments. They have really, in many ways, borne the brunt of COVID response. And so working with them for the last nine months has been very inspiring um, to see parole boards figure out how to do their work remotely, to see supervision officers figure out how to do their work by phone. We've basically had a, a an overnight experiment happen nationwide. And we've learned a lot of things from it. Like incarceration is down 20% nationwide. And there's no data to suggest that that reduction in incarceration has caused any increase in crime. So that oh already gosh. teaches us quite a lot, right? right. And that's not even to mention all of the kinds of operational changes like doing parole and probation by phone that could make people's lives easier and save taxpayer dollars without compromising public safety, right? So there, there are sort of these innovations that we found all over the place, big and small, I think, from COVID. But of course, that being said, it, it, it's been a bad time. It's been a horrible time, as you've alluded to. But if I can summarize what you said so that I can understand it, you basically said COVID is bad, it caused us to rethink the way we're doing incarceration. People were led out of prison and crime didn't go up. And we have data to show that. Yep. I think that's a good summary. Oh my gosh. And then on the side, we also discovered all these other things just about the way we were working and had been working for so long that that might not be necessary. You know, like this, this is sort of necessity is the mother of invention. And yes. we saw some breakthroughs, some of which I, I hope will stay in place. And others, by the way, that, that were very bad. <laughs> so, for example, we know that it's really important when you're in prison to be able to be visited by your friends and family. And none of that has been able to happen during COVID. Mm. And, and we know that that will uh, not only has it had a huge impact on people during this time, but it will also have an impact on reentry outcomes. And you can't fix that. You can't fix that right now, not without a vaccine. Like literally cannot have people visiting yeah. in person. Yeah, they're, they're like big cruise ships um, that people visit during the day and then go back to their families. So mass incarceration became a public health issue for, mm. for everyone, which was another bleak but good side effect is that having this many people in prison was a danger to all of us and still is a danger to all of us as we enter the, the second or third wave or whatever we're calling this fall. <sighs> I don't know what we're calling it, but it feels like we've been in lockdown since March, at yeah. least here in Minneapolis it does. What do the leaders and the decision makers think about the data? Do they believe it? If they see the data that we just described and it shows that crime doesn't go up when um, incarceration goes down, do, do they believe it? Do they like trust the accuracy of the data? We are integrating directly with the state's source of truth data systems, and, and that's a different approach from what a lot of folks are doing in the space. So we don't get a lot of pushback on the numbers we're presenting to leadership because up front we're ensuring that we can recreate the numbers that they trust and everything builds on top of that. Mm. So, so that's a difference between the data we're presenting them maybe versus what they're reading in the news or elsewhere. But yeah, I, I think that, you know, there's... 
a lot of hunger for data at the moment and that people who are running the system recognize that COVID presents a completely unprecedented problem. Like they were lapping up data just as much as anyone else. Well, they had, there was no precedent for the situation and they were kind of sitting in between public no. safety and public health trying to juggle these two concerns. And so in the states where we were able to actually track people who were getting out early due to COVID and compare those people's outcomes to people who were sort of getting out at that time anyway, and to people who were getting out one year ago when the economy was more normal, that has been, I think, the most helpful data that we've been able to provide during COVID. I, I can hear how passionate <laughs> you are about the about this organization, about what you're doing, and, and I have to commend you on everything that you are doing. And I wonder what inspires you. Like, it, it, there are days I'm sure that are just bad when there is pandemic and it's affecting everything and it's just awful to get to the next day and to the next launch. What What is inspiring what you're doing right now? I think the moment that the field is in is hard to not be excited about. You've got incarceration mm -hmm. down temporarily. You've got budgets down, which is forcing a set of questions around how we can create a smaller, cheaper system that produces better outcomes. And then you also have the Black Lives Matter movement that's putting attention on the system in a way that's really important, that's causing sort of policymakers to, to need to look at the racial disparities in the system and find solutions. So I, you know, I hope that in the next few years, as a field, we've used this moment to safely and substantially reduce the incarceration rate. I also think it's important to, during this moment, think about reducing the number of people on supervision. It's in some ways the less talked mm. about problem, but something like one in 55 Americans or four and a half million people are on probation or, or parole. And this is a, a big driver of sort of the collateral consequences of incarceration. So I, I think reducing the supervision population is something that I am excited about as well. Reducing collateral consequences in general, I think more than 5 million Americans can't vote because of felony convictions. And so for oh. the world's proudest democracy, I think that's not a cute look. No. So yeah. And, th and then, like I said before, I think the other thing I'm excited about is, is very seriously and methodically reinvesting savings from reducing incarceration into the community, because I think that is the path to addressing the deep disparities that are in the system today. We need to invest in education and addiction treatment and mental health, especially in communities that are underserved, that are marginalized. That's, that's actually what's going to help us sort of over time stop using prisons for things they were never designed to do. I couldn't agree with you more. And I hope that the next administration brings us that kind of hope and that kind of investment in our future and that we can get to uh, doing exactly what you described and what is in the mission of recidive is in the future. I hope so, too. Join us again in the future, please, Clementine, and tell us how it's going. Maybe in a year or two, we can, we'll, we'll revisit and see, see where you're at. That sounds great. I'd love to. Thank you so much for spending your time with me today. It's been so great talking to you. Yes, you too. Thanks, Yvonne. Clementine Jacoby is the executive director of Recidiviz, a nonprofit that is building a technical foundation for a more accountable and self-improving criminal justice system. You can find them online at recidiviz.org. You've been listening to the 107 podcast. Find us online at 107.com slash podcast. And if you have a second, do send us a message. We love hearing from you. Our email address is podcast at 107.com. Until next time, this is Ivan Stegich. Thanks for listening.